Hello and welcome to our special edition on CBC TV. I'm Anastasia Lavrina and now we will talk more in details about the last events around Armenia, Azerbaijan, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. My guest now is Orhan Amashev, a lawyer. Good evening and welcome to our special edition. Hello, hi, it's great to be here. Thank you. So let's discuss the last events. Just yesterday there was a meeting of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Armenia and Azerbaijan in Geneva with the participation of the OEC Minsk Group co-chairs. But actually, honestly speaking, the people in Azerbaijan don't think and believe much in these uh, statements which were um, after this meeting presented by the official website, uh, the press statement of the co-chairs of the OEC means group achieved in Geneva. So one of the main, one of the key points in this statement is that the sites will not deliberately target civilian populations or non-military objects in accordance with international humanitarian law. But we know many cases when Armenia actually violated the international humanitarian law and targeted the civilian objects in the Barda city, in Ganja city, and not only. What do you think about this meeting? and what are your expectations from the achieved results? Well, I think that, first of all, the OEC Minsk Group is pretty much defunct. I mean, they have been a complete failure in the course of the last decades, and the Azerbaijani public doesn't trust this uh, organization. Uh, they have a clear mandate, but still, uh, when it comes to the way they perceived in Azerbaijan, uh, I believe that they do not command the confidence of the nation. Uh, uh, and actually, a lot of people are talking about the replacement of OEC Minsk Group with 2 plus 2 system, which would entail Azerbaijan and Armenia as conflicting sites, and uh, Turkey and Russia. As long as this particular meeting and the results are concerned, yes, I mean, if you, if you, if you look at what happened in Baghdad and Ganja, we can clearly see the signs of a war crime, uh, because the uh, object, the territory, heavily populated, densely populated with uh, civilian people, targeted without any military justification because the area was far away from the theater of conflict. Uh, and that didn't give Armenia any military advantage, which is a very important point. Uh, and uh, it was an internationally protected area. So it's a clear sign of war crime. And some of the things uh, committed by Armenians are clearly uh, the crimes against uh, humanity and the use of cluster munitions, the big problem. As you know, there's an international convention uh, it, uh, adopted in 2010. Azerbaijan and Armenia are not part of this treaty, but still the use of cluster munitions against the civilian population is forbidden by international customary law. Indeed, and there is another very important news which I want to bring your attention to. Azerbaijan invited the Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch to come to the region and visit the uh, places so they can see by their own eyes what's happening in the region. And they actually there was a report published by the Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch just a couple of days ago where they stated clearly that, first of all, in this Karabakh war, Armenia uses uh, uh, cluster bombs against civilians in, uh, uh, Ganja, um, in Barda city of Azerbaijan. So they were the representative who could see the picture with their own eyes. So your expectation about this progress, so can, if, if there is a representative who are coming to the region, can see everything, can speak with the population, can actually see the picture, what's happening in the regions, and after there will be more precise attention from the international community and there will be more pressure from the international, again, community and other co-chairs, uh, Minsk Group co-chairs to Armenia. But it was very clear Armenia is committing war crime. It's very good. That I'm very surprised that people from Amnesty International came to Azerbaijan, actually, uh, and because uh, the criminal investigation launched, and uh, we are collecting facts, the important facts which will be used in, in the further part of the legal process. For that reason, uh, Armenia inside uh, the, the Amnesty International Human Rights Watch, they have to, of course, investigate. One of the things, they found the fragments of cluster uh, munitions, which is a very clear case that Armenians recklessly use cluster munitions against civilians. Uh, they are accusing Azerbaijan too, but one of the most important things we have to bear in mind, Barda, Ganja, or Tata, those areas, they were not populated by, uh, there were no re legal military object to target. Uh, Azerbaijan is accused of targeting Khan Kandi, which is the capital of the former oblast, but Khan Kandi does have military object. Uh, one thing we have to bear in mind when it comes to civilian casualties, people die during the war. It is absolutely inevitable. But the, the laws of war, is clear, uh, they are clearly saying that uh, there must be proportionality and military necessity. Azerbaijan was targeting Khan Kandi, 
and the military object, and sadly some civilians died as a result of this process. In the case of Armenia, there was no proportionality, there was no military justification, there was absolutely no reason to target bad apart from frightening the Azerbaijani population. So I think that Amnesty International and uh, Human Rights Watch and other organizations, they have to be uh, clearer in their approach and stance against uh, in relation to Azerbaijan and uh, uh, Armenian forces in Nagorno-Karabakh. And they say they can also take in mind that these two cities are not in the conflict zone. They are quite far away from the conflict, especially the Ganja city, which is, which is 60, 60 kilometers from the uh, conflict zone and still Armenia is targeting these places and moreover uh, the official uh, people in the Armenian government, they are making the official statements saying that if Azerbaijan will not st stop to liberate its territories, but they say occupation is a co as, as they call it, then they will continue to target the civilians in Azerbaijan. So they openly say about this, and I guess, in my opinion, uh, please correct me if I'm not if if I'm mistaken. The international community should bring this case before the court because there is a clear uh, messages of the official Yerevan who are uh, blaming Azerbaijan first from the one side and from the other side they're saying that they will continue to shell to target the uh, civilians. But uh, I also would like to bring your attention: any international conflict can be resolved only when the world community makes an objective political and uh, legal assessment of the conflict. So uh, describing the current situation, we should not more speak about the Madrid principles because uh, Armenia denies the existence of the Madrid principles and Azerbaijan what is did, it's already liberated four regions. So there is no reason to speak about Madrid principles anymore. But taking into uh, consideration the success of Azerbaijani army and the deconstructive position of the Armenian government, how we can possess the current situation around this conflict from the uh, position of uh, international law and uh, international norms and standards? What's very, what is very clear, what is absolute, uh, the thing which is absolutely evident is that the facts on the ground, ground have changed. There was a reality before this Second Karabakh War, and that reality was not exactly in favor of Azerbaijan because Armenia was physically in charge of that occupied territory, Nagorno-Karabakh and seven adjacent territories. Now the facts on the ground have changed. Azerbaijani military forces have changed the factual reality. Now four out of um, the seven uh, surrounding districts have been uh, liberated by Azerbaijani uh, Azerbaijani military forces from the occupation. So Azerbaijan, I think the United Nations must be grateful to Azerbaijan for actually enforcing uh, uh, two out of those four resolutions which have not been implemented in the course of the last uh, decades. Uh, so Azerbaijan is in a very good position currently, and this military uh, and diplomatic success, of course, will define the final status and the settlement of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. And talking about the international legal assessment, if you look at uh, what happened after the Second World War, or if you if you if you, if you look at the example of uh, the tribunal in Yugoslavia and Rwanda, uh, all the time once once the conflict is over. But once we know the winner is winner and uh, loser is loser, then of course the whole thing starts. So once we win this war and the, the results are very clear, I think that there are two ways we can go. Currently there's a criminal investigation in the Republic of Azerbaijan, of course, and the facts are being gathered and so on. But uh, there are two ways Azerbaijan could take Armenia uh, to the international uh, criminal system. The one is they're creating international tribunal, separate tribunal, uh, and the second one, international criminal court. And I think that both of those mechanisms should be tried. You know what is interesting? Because some experts are talking that Armenia is not fighting for the territories, but it's uh, fighting for its internal uh, political situation, political disbalance, which is existing there. And the people are saying that if <coughs> Prime Minister of Armenia, Nikol Pashinyan, now accepts the uh, conditions offered by Azerbaijani side, in any case, he will lose his power. If he will not accept this, on the other hand, the Azerbaijani army will liberate with military power all its uh, Azerbaijani occupied territories. And in any case, he will lose his um, power, I will say, even. And we, if we look at the internal situation inside the Armenian government, we can see that there are so many uh, different sides and who are trying to take the power, who can use the situation in its own terms and etc. But one of the statements, one of the points of the uh, press statement of the uh, co-chairs of the CMEs group, which was uh, published yesterday, is that the sites will provide in writing comments and questions related to possible ceasefire verification mechanism in accordance with item 2 of the October 10 
joint statement. Uh, do you think that there is a possible conditions or for the ceasefire achievements uh, which Armenia can offer or accept from the Azerbaijani side in order to keep its position, but at the same time to work in the conflict resolution in a peaceful manner if it's acceptable for the Armenian side? First of all, I just want to say something very important about uh, Nikol Pashinyan. Uh, I mean, his rhetoric is not very consistent. It, this is a person who was, uh, was saying within the same speech that Karabakh is uh, Armenia full stop, and then saying that any settlement which will be offered should be acceptable to Armenia and Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, at, at one point, he's saying that uh, Nagorno there is no uh, military solution to the problem, and uh, on the second occasion, he's saying that Armenians will fight till the end. I mean, this person's uh, statements and rhetoric are showing that he is neither a good diplomat nor a great statesman, uh, and actually a very shambolic creature on the whole. As long as uh, these particular verification mechanisms are concerned, uh, I think it is very clear from what we have seen so far. Armenia is not going to honor ceasefire regulation requirements. So I, I, I would be very, very skeptical about uh, implementation of the ceasefire. Of course, uh, the, the, the bodies must change, and we see uh, from what happened that Armenians even are not willing to accept their own corpses, which is absolutely appalling and ludicrous, but they are uh, doing uh, this. Uh, and for that reason, I'm not very optimistic about ceasefire. I expect the, the, con uh, the continuation of the military conflict and uh, looking forward to hearing more good news from the battlefield. If you look at the situation from the point of the international law, uh, just recently the foreign minister of Armenia Zorat Natsukanyan gave an interview uh, where he also stated that Armenia is trying to protect the people who are living in the Nagorno-Karabakh region of Azerbaijan, but definitely he, he didn't mention that, but he says that we try to help these people, we try to protect them, that's why we uh, continue this war and trying to protect, to defend this population. But on the other side, if you look uh, on these people, they are actually, they are the victims of the region which is not actually existing in the official Yeri one because these people are staying in the conflict zone it's from the one side and on the other hand we see that uh, they call actually very young people to take the weapon and go to fight for the territory which is not even belongs to the Armenian government. So uh, how from the international points of view, from the international law points of view, we can uh, comment on this situation because many people from the international community also ask the question how these people will live in these territories after Azerbaijan to liberate all of these territories and if Azerbaijan can guarantee the safeness of these people? Well, first of all, you, you talked about the involvement of uh, young soldiers and this is another war crime which I mean is committing currently because there have been some videos, I've seen them, I'm sure you have seen too, we see that young people, people Definitely, you see from the physical trace of the person that is younger than 18 or possibly younger than 15 are being used uh, in the military uh, conflict. And this is a war crime. It's a uh, child soldier shouldn't be used uh, in the military conflict. And, you know, there are two different categories. Those uh, under the age of 15 shouldn't be used at all. And those uh, between 15 and 18 could be used, but not for in the direct military confrontation. So Armenia is committing war crimes in that direction. Armenia is using the gold reserves of Kalmajad. We heard from the assistant uh, Azerbaijani president that they have been using gold reserves uh, for, the, for that particular brand there called is Frank also, Müller. There is also an ecological crime, if I'm not mistaken, on these territories. So ecological crime, because that is not required by the military. Some, there's no military necessity to do that. So Armenia is committing all of these crimes. And one uh, thing which is very clear is that uh, Nikol uh, Pashinyan is always talking about the self-determination of Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh. First of all, uh, Armenia's position is not flexible at all. Uh, they are, you know, before this conflict, they were saying that it's not just Nagorno-Karabakh should be part of so-called Arsak, but also the lowland Karabakh. And actually, they were adding to that claim that they have some pretensions. They want some other territories of Azerbaijan, which is absolutely ludicrous. Um, so um, we can't see any flexibility in that sort of position. Uh, and, uh, and also, there's another thing. They talk about self-determination. One thing is very clear. First of all, not everybody in Nagorno-Karabakh is Armenian. Yes, currently they are all Armenians because Azerbaijanis were ethnically cleansed from there, but the proportion was 75-25. Uh, this is one thing. And secondly, self-determination should always be in line with the territorial integrity. As Azerbaijani President Hamadi said it very clearly, Armenians have decided uh, they determined themselves, they have they've used their rights for self-determination by creating Armenian states. Uh, 
And another thing is that Nagorno-Karabakh has never been part of an independent sovereign Armenian state. As we know, there was a Karabakh Khanate before the Russian Empire. Under the Russian Empire, there was no national unit called Armenia or Azerbaijan. Then Soviet Union, Armenians always said that uh, it was under Stalin that Karabakh was transferred from, uh, from Armenia to Azerbaijan. But actually, the decision was that the decision was to uh, make sure that Karabakh remains as a part of Azerbaijan, not, be, not is being transferred. And Armenian, one of the Armenian arguments about the independence of Nagorno-Karabakh, it's a legal argument, but it's not, it's not a proper argument, of course. They're saying that Nagorno-Karabakh decided to leave Azerbaijani Soviet Republic and join uh, Armenia, which is true. There was a decision by the local parliament of Nagorno-Karabakh Oblast, but that decision was not approved by the Supreme Council of the Soviet Union. So in 1991, when Soviet Union collapsed, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia emerged as independent states with their borders, and Nagorno-Karabakh was inside uh, inside uh, Azerbaijan. So, from that point of view, both historically and from the legal point of view, Armenian claim is uh, totally ludicrous and preposterous. From the legal point of view, I totally accept your explanation of the situation, of the current situation and what was happening previously. And we shouldn't forget also about the, uh, those refugees and IDPs which appeared in Azerbaijan as a result of the policy of annexation from the Armenian side. And Armenia cannot speak about self-determination of any kind of territory from where uh, thousands of Azerbaijanis were illegally expelled uh, in the end of 19th, in the beginning of the, uh, in the end of 18th, sorry, in the beginning of the 19th. But talking about the resolution process, what we see now, you also mentioned that OECA Minsk Group is not efficient. We can see that there are so many statements, so many documents, uh, joint agreements and etc., which is not working. And actually Armenia behaves and possesses itself as not very reliable partner because the first meeting was held in Russia, which is very close partner of Armenia. And Russia guaranteed that there will be a ceasefire, humanitarian ceasefire, and after some hours, we saw that Armenia violated this by targeting the Azerbaijani second largest city, Ganja. So uh, we see that Minsk Group OEC is not so much effective as we were relying on it during the last almost 30 years. But there is another alliance, you slightly mentioned this in the beginning of our conversation, it's Iran and also Turkey. And there is also the proposal from the Iranian side that, uh, actually we don't know much about this proposal, it's hidden from the audience, but still they are saying that there is a kind of a possible agreement for the long-term uh, solution of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict within the territorial integrity of the countries, which means the de-occupation of Azerbaijani territory. So can we say that this kind of alliance, which was quite much effective in the Syria, I mean the Astana process, between Iran, Turkey and Russia can be more effective rather than Minsk Group COEC and can be effective in the um, close-term resolution of this conflict? OEC Minsk Group, as we said, is, is, is complete failure. They haven't achieved uh, anything tangible. And there's a huge degree of frustration because, as you know, the position of international law has always been very clear. We always talk about four resolution. There was also the resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations, uh, other uh, documents adopted by different international organizations, but OEC Minsk Group co-chairs failed. Uh, out of these three cultures, it's very clear that Russia still remains very much committed to the region because Azerbaijan was part of the Soviet Union. Russia is in the region, it's a regional power. But America and France are slightly different. In the course of the last couple of years, it is evident that their power and the clout in the region is being, has, been, has decreased quite uh, substantially. In particular, France, I think, doesn't have any moral entitlement to be a co-chair of the uh, Minsk group because uh, they should be neutral. And what kind of neutrality you can talk about if they have this uh, Armenian lobby in their own country and their political institutions under the influence of that lobby. So we, we can't expect that level of neutrality because me me mediator is somebody who doesn't decide anything but facilitates the process and they have to be absolutely neutral. For that, uh, I, I believe in terms of Turkey and Iran, that thing you mentioned, yes, as we see America and, uh, and France are no longer uh, playing the role which they were bound to play, uh, and we see Turkey is becoming a very pivotal power in the region, and it's quite natural because Turkey uh, was an imperial power before, in South Caucasus was always within the interest of influence of 
Turkey, all the borders of the current states in the South Caucasus uh, were drawn with the Turkish participation. It's only quite natural that Turkey, Russia must be involved in this process. I'm not entirely sure about Iran, of course. Iran, you know, the, the, the relations are improving, and after Azerbaijani military forces have uh, liberated Zangilan, there was a clear statement from the Iranian side that they fully support the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. Uh, that is very good. Of course, uh, with Iran, Azerbaijan is bound to have great relations. But in terms of the regulation of the conflict settlement process, I expect Turkey to be far more assertive both uh, in terms of uh, uh, arguments and in terms of helping the conflict, conflicting sides to come to the terms. Because Armenia, I think, by losing Nagorno-Karabakh, will be in a far more advanced state. Because Nagorno-Karabakh is a, some kind of a toxic problem. It's a problem which doesn't allow the region to be uh, fully in a position of advancing itself. And Armenia is effectively is dependent on Russia hugely because of this conflict. So I expect by uh, the uh, by losing Nagorno-Karabakh Armenian military forces, uh, Armenia will actually get a certain degree of independence, which will benefit the country. Well, let's hope that Armenian government will take to the decision to stop its aggressive policy against Azerbaijan, will stop shelling the civilians and will think about its own future because the future of Armenian government depends on the successful resolution of Armenia-Azerbaijan-Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and the full liberation of Azerbaijani territories from the Armenian military forces, but not from the people who are civilians who are living in the occupied Azerbaijani <laughs> territories. Popula Armenian population, Azerbaijani approach is very receptive. Azerbaijan is embracing all ethnic minorities, not just Armenians. And Azerbaijan is more than happy uh, to give cultural autonomy to the people of Armenian origin. The people, Armenians who belong to Karabakh, are more than welcome to stay there and they, 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 their cultural rights will be preserved. But of course, no referendum hasn't made it abundantly clear. No because Azerbaijan was never committed to anything called referendum. Some people are saying that we promised at some point that there would be, there would be a referendum, but that's not true. Because Azerbaijani position was very clear. No process leading to the creation of independent state in the territories of Azerbaijan can possibly be contemplated. And for that reason, I think that our position, Azerbaijani position, has been consistent. Definitely. Thank you very much, Mr. Amasha, for this interesting conversation. Thank you Thank for you joining us. Thank you. You watch special edition on CBC TV and my special guest today, Orhan Amashev, a lawyer. We discuss the last events around Armenia-Azerbaijan-Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. I'm Anastasia Lavrina and see you in the next edition.